I work for a government agency. I'm always looking for good, enthusiastic men to help us carry out our directives. You're telling me that there is a movie company in Hollywood right now that is funded by the CIA? I think probably Hollywood is full of CIA agents, and we just don't know it. I mean, can you ever really trust another human being? No, the answer is you cannot. Either very smart or incredibly stupid. Test, test, everything's a test, remember? Nothing is what it seems. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the CIA and Hollywood. My name is Pierce Redman, and this is Episode 8, The Quiet American. Besides, it was 11 in the morning, and I knew precisely where Fuang would be, having her milkshake at the milk bar across from the Continental. this of all hours, the, the shopping hour, when the place is filled with women and children. What are you talking about? Oh, do you think your General Tay would call off the bombing because the parade was cancelled? No, no, this is much better than a parade. This is front page news. This, the blood of women and children, that, that, that's real news. You must be out of your mind. Look, who puts your General Tay on that, all right? Look, that red color on the street, there's, there's your third force. And those things being carried by on stretchers, there's your national democracy. Why don't you shut up? For once in your life, why don't you just shut up and help somebody? Well, Pierce, it's great to be talking to you again. It's great to be embarking on another season of the CIA in Hollywood. And uh, before we get into today's film, The Quiet American, I thought we'd have a quick run through of what people can expect from this second season, because it's going to be a bit different, isn't it, to season one? It's going to be a little weirder, more speculative. <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> <laughs> We've been discussing this for months, obviously. Mm-hmm. And we decided to take a bit of a different angle with this. Um, we're exploring more films, uh, ultimately. Well, I don't actually know if we're exploring a higher number of films, but, but more episodes. We're going to be doing nine mm-hmm. episodes with uh, seven guests, assuming everything goes to plan. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, yeah, we'll just quickly run through those. Uh, the Quiet American, which we're doing today. Good Night and Good Luck. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which I know you're very much looking forward to. Yes. <laughs> Men Who Stare at Goats, American Ultra, Race to Witch Mountain, Zero Dark Thirty, and we're going to be finishing up with Salt. Mm. But yeah, which of those are you looking forward to the most? Well, I guess, I mean, I'm looking forward to all of them, obviously, because as as you just said, Tom, we've been talking about this and doing research and whatnot for months. So I'm just I'm just excited that we're, we're really doing it now. Um, well, definitely... Um, 
I'm definitely looking forward to Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. That one probably uh, I thought was the maybe one of the most bizarre movies that we that we picked. And there's yeah, just so yeah. much there's so much there. Chuck Barris is such a fascinating and despicable character <laughs> that we need to get into him. Um and I think I think that episode in particular, uh people will, will I mean I'm excited about that one because that really encapsulates so much of what we talk about in terms of Hollywood and celebrity culture, the power of celebrity. Uh, the detrimental effect that, you know, um, I don't know, kind of dumbing down the population can have through television. Mm -hmm. Chuck Barris was uh, a master at doing that. So I'm very excited about that. But in truth, I'm excited about all of them. I'm excited about Race to Witch Mountain, because I think that's just that's going to be a real out there kind of film. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's probably the one I'm most looking forward to. If only because it stars The Rock, and I'm a huge fan yes, of it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's got The Rock, like, yeah, UFOs, um, mysterious, what not to love. Yeah, mysterious CIA agents on set. So that one, I mean, I'm excited about all of them. I think uh, I'm excited. I also, I mean, I really enjoyed, for instance, um, last season, The Social Network. So I'm excited about uh, movies like Good Night and Good Luck, where there's not. I think it's it's not a, a sh, you know a kind of cut and dry. This is a CIA production. You know, we're hmm. really going to kind of uh, pull the curtain behind that and start. You know, and we're going to be presenting a couple really interesting theories with that movie in particular. So I mean, I'm excited about all of them. I'm excited about all the guests. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about the men who stare at goats. Um, you know, there's, there's so much in that movie, uh, and, you know, and then that one touches on a lot of the, some of the stuff we talked in the first season with the occult and, you know, bizarre, uh, you know, that one's got mind control and psychics and, you know, CIA agents and whatnot. So what's not to love with that? So I'm, I'm really excited about all of these movies, but I'm also really excited about, as you said, that we're kind of expanding the season in terms of the scope and in terms of what we're, we're going to be dissecting. Cause I think the, the first season we were very much, uh, let's just, let's lay out the, the, um, the connections, you know, in, in sort of straightforward terms. And again, we, we chose a lot of movies that Chase Brandon was involved with. Uh, most of the movies in that first season, it was very easy. You could point to, oh, okay, well, this particular CIA advisor was on set or this guy, you know, was a consultant. Uh, and, and they were generally all of those movies. It was easy. You could pick out, oh, well, you know, they mentioned CIA or this is about the CIA. Whereas in this season, it, it's not quite so clear. I'm also excited too, just to we, we've got a couple of George Clooney films in here, and I <laughs> have a special dislike for George Clooney, so I can't wait to get into that. Also, well, cool. I mean, like you, I'm looking forward to, I'd say, all of them very much so. But um, perhaps Race to Witch Mountain will be the one I'm most excited about. <laughs> but like you say, of these films, I'd say five have known CIA involvement, and four we're not so sure about. So. We're taking a bigger step into the unknown in mm -hmm. season one. We're exploring the possibility that some of these films are a kind of overture to the CIA, perhaps, mm -hmm. by some of the people involved, or at least certainly with the Clooney ones, they're part of the backstory. They're part of what led up to Argo, which is one of the most important CIA Hollywood productions that we obviously discussed at the end of season one. So... A lot to look forward to. A lot to look forward to. Mm -hmm. But without more preamble, I guess we should get into The Quiet American. And of course, we're talking about the 1950s version, the 1958 adaptation that was written and directed by Joseph Mankiewicz, rather than the 2002 version. It's fair to say we're both pretty big fans of the original book, the novel by Graham Greene. Mm -hmm. And he, interestingly enough, of course, worked for MI6 during World War II. So... Essentially, this is a story that is set in 1950s Saigon, right, during the time of the initial communist insurgency against French colonial rule. And so we have our protagonist, Thomas Fowler, who is an English journalist in Saigon, just like Graham Greene was. And his antagonist is an American named Pyle, who is working for, we're not 100% <laughs> sure who, but some form of covert agency, military or intelligence, whatever. And in between these two men is Fuong, a beautiful young Vietnamese woman who is having a love affair with Fowler, but who Pyle then falls for and manages to persuade her to leave Fowler and shack up with him instead. As the story progresses, 
Fowler learns that Pyle is obsessed with creating a third force, neither communist nor colonialist, and that he does this via the Cow Dai religious group, and in specific, specifically the sect of that led by General Tay. Bombs start going off in the streets of Saigon, which Fowler learns is the result of these covert activities that Pyle is up to, and he conspires with the communists to have Pyle assassinated. Do you think that's a fair summary of the yeah. basic storyline there? Mm. Or do you well, have yeah, to add to that? I, that? That's a fair summary of the book, um, which we should be clear. Yeah. The movie is uh, quite different. But yeah, that's uh, that's essentially the sort of broad strokes of, of the book. Um, of course, I mean, it's, it's Graham Greene and it's a novel, so there's so much in there. You know, we could probably, I mean, me and Tom, we were talking, we could do a whole series just on Graham Greene. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, because he was a, a very much um, wrote his books with a cinematic sort of a, an idea in mind. Um, I was just reading a quote from him recently where he was saying that uh, when he writes a book, he never, he doesn't write it sort of uh, like a photographer. He writes it like a, a cinematographer where it's moving images. And of course, mm. Graham Greene, um, wrote screenplays for, I mean, a ton of his movies, The Quiet American, Our Man in Havana, um, The Human Factor, uh, The Third Man, of course, with Carol Reed, which is an amazing film. Uh, a couple others, I think. Um, no, he was certainly yeah. quite a prolific screenwriter. Mm. That's certainly fair to say. Mm. And, I mean, yeah, one of the most interesting aspects of the book, or the, the part that most, I don't know, struck me, stayed with me, is the, the dialogue, the philosophical dialogue about what's going on here. Because the Fowler character in the book is so... I, I don't really want to call him cynical. I guess he is cynical, but yeah. certainly world-weary. Yes. <laughs> um, it's fair to say. And he explains how, you know, this notion of, oh, let's get involved in some civil war halfway around the world because of some abstract idealistic notion about individual liberty that you kind of wonder, well, if you really believe in individual liberty, don't you believe that you should leave them to it? Or, mm. And and just arguing that like the people don't care. They don't care about colonialism versus communism. They care about, do they have enough to eat and are the bombings going to stop? Mm -hmm. um, and I just found those things very profound, particularly from a book written in the mid-1950s. I mean, these things are obviously still just as profound now, but are perhaps more you know, articulated more often now. Whereas in that book, that's the stuff that really mattered to me, at least, anyway. No, I, I think uh, I, what uh, always made an impact on me, and I read this book um, many years ago, I think back when I was in high school, is uh, A, is, is the sort of graphic depictions of war that Green does put in the book. There's a, a sequence early on where he goes to Fatsiem, and, you know, unlike the 1958 film, it is pretty horrific, uh, mm. the... the uh, scene that he's describing there's a, a part where they're trying to cross a canal and they get uh stuck in the boat because there's so many dead bodies everywhere uh and and green is great at, at writing about the sort of boredom and fear that war produces in people and the kind of desperation and that you know you're you ultimately turn to when you're in a war zone so i think that's a uh, and i think that's why there were so many people that uh, disliked the book when it came out this was shortly after, you know, World War II had just ended. Um, Korea had more or less ended, but people, you know, it was it was uh, it was definitely not, uh, you know, in vogue to be talking about how horrible war was. No, we're supposed to love war, <laughs> you know, and and Green was well, to be talking about how ultimately terrible the notion of fighting a war for the name of Western individualism or yes. liberation or something like that. Really mm. is. You know, that whole liberal humanitarian psychopathic warfare thing that we have yeah. so commonly under like the Obama administration mm. um, and quite criticized, I think now. But at the time. He was, I think he was ahead of his time. This guy was, Graham Greene was a very smart man. Mm. Oh, yeah, the book is very prophetic in terms of the liberal interventionist uh, philosophy. Because obviously there, you know, Greene could have very easily been like, oh, this is all about, you know, defeating those evil, you know, the yellow peril and all that kind of crap. But he does, he, he focuses much more on Pyle's uh, liberal interventionism that, you know, Pyle uses all this sort of intellectual BS about liberty and democracy and human rights and all of those sort of things, but, uh, and uses that as a way to sort of mask the fact that he's 
blowing up women and children. Um, the, the scene uh, in the book uh, where the, the big explosion happens uh, right in front of the Continental Hotel where Graham Greene used to live and frequent. Yeah, the big uh, car bombings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's horrible. I mean, that scene is, you know, he describes a man with, uh, you know, his bottom half missing. He describes a woman uh, holding her maimed baby and just putting a hat over it so that no one could see. And Pyle kind of is, uh, oh, well, that's okay. They died for democracy. It's all right. Um, you know, yes, yeah, so of course, we, we meant to hit a military parade, but it's okay if it was just innocent people. It might even be better. And that's very much, that's like the Madeleine Albright, oh, yeah, killing 500,000 Iraqi children was good because it got well, it's that a, much closer towards freeing the Iraqi people from evil Saddam. Well, yeah, so, supposedly we're saving lives and creating freedom in the long run. So right. <laughs> can't make an omelet and all mm. that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's uh, and that was a notion um, that a lot of uh, liberals didn't like. Uh, with Graham Greene. You know, they were very much on board for, oh, yes, he's this this wonderful, smart, you know, savvy, intellectual British writer. But when he started calling them out for, you know, you're not really doing this for democracy or human rights. If you were, you wouldn't be using this bizarre religious sect. Uh, and within that, this psychopathic warlord, essentially, who goes around bombing women and children and then boasts about it. <laughs> on the radio, as uh, General Tay did after that bombing. So, yeah, I mean, like most of uh, Graham Greene's books are very prophetic. Uh, and he definitely, I think, understood trends. He understood the direction uh, that politics was going in. And no doubt part of that was uh, from his time in MI6 when he was in uh, Angola. Oh, no, it's, no, I'm sorry, not Angola, Sierra Leone. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, and I, I would just want to say that, you know, the uh, one of my other favorite uh, scenes uh, in the book is the opium house scene when they're in Haiphong with uh, this French captain. And that's again, it just uh, it, I mean, first off, they're talking about napalm, which seems like a very sort of American 60s sort of a discussion. Mm. Um, you know, it's always, oh, yeah, yeah the napalm was horrible. Uh, that the Americans trapped, and of course it is, and obviously, I mean, uh, countless millions of people are still suffering uh, from the effects of napalm. So, you know, there's all sorts of uh, mental problems, deformities, things like that. But it, it's just important to note that the, the French were using napalm for a while there, uh, and they there's a it's just a, a wonderful way where Graham's sort of talking with this Captain Truin about the sort of horrible effects of napalm. Uh, and he, again, he talks about the horrors of war and also this notion that uh, awful things happen on both sides because you're ultimately forced to do that. And Captain Truin is very straightforward when he's talking with Fowler about this isn't about colonialism or anything like that. This is just about uh, politicians sending soldiers to some country that they've never really heard of or only in this sort of distant, quote unquote, exotic orientalist sort of a way and, and it's just pointless that war is a pointless endeavor he makes this great line about how well in a couple years the politicians will sign a deal with the communists um and everything will go back to the way it could have been at the beginning of this war but instead we fought for so many years uh and it's just a great and and that that whole sequence that's when fowler is really like holy shit what have I gotten myself into? So that was just a really powerful scene. And again, the book is uh, it's phenomenal. I love Graham Greene. Uh, and I really enjoy this book as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've only read this book, whatever, a month or so ago in, in preparation for all of this. I'd never read it before, but I was struck by just how wonderfully crafted it was, how intelligent it was. But also it's really emotive. It's really emotionally affecting as mm -hmm. well. It's, it's got everything going for it. It really has. But I guess two questions we should get into before we go further and look at how the book was adapted into the film. Uh, is Fowler actually Graham Greene? And is Pyle actually Edward Lansdale? Mm. Because Greene always denied this. He denied this flatly. But he was in Saigon, and he was in Saigon at this time, and at the same time as Lansdale was. Lansdale was negotiating with General Tay, as Pyle is depicted in the book, and the idea was about creating a third force to some extent. So it seems there's something to this, isn't there? Yeah, I think this is um, th th this this sort of argument went back and forth for uh, up until you know Graham Greene passed away. 
Uh, there were always these sort of rumors. And I think to a degree, uh, Edward Lansdale was definitely someone that liked being in the spotlight. And for all of, of Lansdale's complaints about how, oh, I'm not, you know, that's not me or whatever. He certainly uh, at times played up the idea that, yes, that is me. I am the quiet American. Because Lansdale was ultimately, you know, he was a, a he wanted publicity. He wanted people to know who he was. Now, Green did, as you said, continually deny this. He said that um, at one point he was driving uh, back to Saigon from somewhere and he had sort of uh, – he was fallen in with some economic attaches, which at the time it was – uh, you know, publicly known that these were really CIA agents and that sure. they drove back to Saigon and that this guy continually talked about the third force. So I think that is, uh, that, that very well might be true. A lot of Green's books were very much based on, you know, real personal experiences that he had, people that he met. But the similarities between Lansdale and Pyle are so in your face that I, I can't believe that Graham Green. You know, if he made it all up, that's amazing. But now <laughs> little, little details. No, it's more likely that he didn't, yeah. Yeah, I mean, little details like uh, uh, Pyle is always walking around with his dog. Edward Lansdale was the only American walking around with a dog in all of Saigon. Um, you know, and, and that was something that Lansdale always pointed to. People said, it's oh, it's not you. He would say, well, why does he have a dog? Early on in the book and in the, I believe, in the film as well, Certainly in the book, uh, when he goes to see Pyle, he, uh, Pyle has several books. One of them is this, this fictional character, York Harding, who is this stupid, you know, liberal interventionist. But he also has up on his bookshelf a book all about the Philippines and the insurgency and the war there. That's where Lansdale sort of cut his teeth um, yeah, was in yeah. the Philippines. So, again, that's a pretty, I would say, direct comparison. And there is also, according to Lansdale, they did actually see each other uh, at one point in time. And I believe this was, he said it was in 1954 um, that he, he walked, uh, probably the, either the Continental or the Majestic Hotel. Graham Greene was there with a large group of people. Lansdale walked in with his French poodle. Uh, Graham Greene saw him, muttered something to his friends. And according to Lansdale, they all started booing him. Um, so, uh, this is from Lansdale. Now, maybe he's exaggerating, maybe he's making this up, but they definitely were in the same, they were in Saigon at the same period of time. I think it's inconceivable that they didn't, they weren't aware of one another. So, I think part of it is, is, uh, Graham Greene is a, a very uh, strange individual. Uh, he, he doesn't always, uh, tell the whole truth perhaps is one way of putting it when it comes to personal things and stuff like that. You know, he was notorious for, uh, if you wanted to do an interview with him, he flat out would say no. But the, the few interviews that do exist were only audio. He wouldn't be filmed, you know, on camera. He was a very private person. And I think he, he did grow up in that sort of spy world. So, um, you know, maybe well, that's he's... interesting in itself, isn't it? That he wouldn't be um, interviewed on camera because if it's audio, you can always say, oh, well, they chopped up my words and put them out of context or out of right. order or something. But if you're on tape, you're on tape. If people yes. can see you, they can see you did actually say those words in that order in that way. So no, very interesting. Very mm. interesting. I mean, I, I buy it. I think it is. I don't think Pyle is Lansdale, just as no. I don't think Fowler is Green. I think that's a simplification in both cases. But it's clear that Green is basing the Fowler character on himself. And I imagine he was hanging around in Saigon, chatting up the local Vietnamese women and smoking quite a lot of opium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> which, which is, to be fair, what Fowler spends most of the book doing. But Lansdale, obviously Pyle isn't Lansdale as a one-to-one, -one, but it seems there's too many elements in there for it to not be somewhat based on him. Yes. And if this story about 1954 is true, where Green comes in and says something to his friends and they all start booing Lansdale, is this actually something to do with what happens in the book? Because if Green really did find out that the Americans and Lansdale in particular were helping General Tay and his crazy sect carry out bombings in Saigon, he probably would be pretty disgusted by that and might well have been going around telling people. Mm. Mm. I I'm just speculating the, here, but yeah. you know what I'm getting at. 
Yeah, I think one one important note is I believe the 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 bombings that General Tay uh, was committing that are sort of referenced in the book. Those I believe actually happened prior to Lansdale actually being in Vietnam, but. Um, we can get into that too because there's also some evidence that that's not really the case or that either way the CIA had been uh, supplying General Tay at least since like 1952, which would um, would be before Lanza was officially posted in, in uh, Vietnam. An interesting thing too is that uh, Graham Greene, when he would deny it, he would also say that no, because Pyle was idealistic and Lansdale was simply evil. And I would never want to write a book – that would, um, you know, inadvertently glorify or, or you know, create this this mythical figure. He, you know, that's how much he hated Lansdale. But I actually find that Pyle is, in fact, evil. Um, that while he is idealistic, his flippancy when it comes to murdering women and children and his sort of larger ideas, he's like a he is like a true psychopath in the sense that he thinks what he's doing is great. That this is all okay. There's nothing. There's nothing really wrong with this because he's fighting for democracy. And I think that yeah, Lansdale was. I think also ultimately thought that what he was doing was good. That this is. It, it went beyond. Well, this is just my job. You know, Lansdale was uh, very committed. He he did. He spent a lot of time. Um, you know, just sort of learning about Vietnamese culture and all those sort of things. So I think he was truly invested in this beyond. Well, it's about stopping the commies from marching south. So yeah, I think um, the, the comparison, I mean, the comparisons are there for a reason. There's a reason that people are still arguing about this is because they, <laughs> they are in many cases very blatant. And I think, yeah, that like most of the characters that appear throughout Graham Greene's novel, particularly uh, his political novels or what he would call entertainments are based on people that he really did know. Um, so either way, you know, at least uh, at the very least, Graham Greene knew of some CIA guy who talked about the third force all the way from, you know, on a long car ride all the way back to Saigon. And then he made a, uh, you know, modeled a character off this guy who also had a dog who was also involved in the Philippines who, you know, <laughs> mirrored Lansdale in so many other ways. So make of it what you will. Well, and I think it's important to emphasize he clearly also knew at least about the stories that these bombings in Saigon were being caused by General Tay's group rather than the yes. communists that they were blamed on. Mm. Whether or not he had any kind of inside information, I don't know, but he clearly grasped that much. And so whether or not that individual was Lansdale, I suppose, maybe doesn't matter a mm. huge amount. It's clearly based on several people, perhaps. Yeah. And, and I think it's overall the Pyle character is just a metaphor for American liberal interventionism. Yes. Um, when you break it down. And the individual characteristics, it seems, have probably been selected from multiple people that he actually knew or knew of while he was there. But let's get into the film, because I suppose <laughs> that is what we're supposed to be talking about. Right. Um, and specifically what Mankiewicz changed, because he changed so much. Mm. And ironically, perhaps not so ironically, with encouragement and some assistance from Lansdale. And I think the most fundamental thing is that he depoliticized the film. The political elements are just pushed into the background, and it's all disguised behind this love triangle. Not entirely unlike the social network, where the actual story of the development of Facebook and how it became this great big thing is pushed to the background of this story about friendship and betrayal and melodrama, right? Mm. Um, you want to get into what's so different about the film? Well, yeah, the- I mean, as you said, the the political overtones are virtually just don't even exist in the movie. Um, it is very much this love triangle between Fowler, Pyle, and Fong. Uh, the, he also sort of, you know, he, he certainly makes some very deliberate changes to Fowler and Pyle. So Fowler in the film... Played actually, I think quite well by Michael Redgrave. I think he, he yeah. does give a great performance. It's just not the kind of Fowler that you want to see. He comes across as a much more sort of a a dirty, horny old man, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. sort of devoid of all morals. Whereas, yeah, Fowler is sort of a you know, yes, he is an older man who's sleeping with the Fong is like eighteen, maybe nineteen, yeah, um, in the novel. But Fowler does have morals. He does know right from wrong. 
Uh, whereas in the film version, that's sort of blurred a little bit. He also makes uh, Pyle in the novel is uh, the, the sort of classic CIA agent. He's from Massachusetts. He, I believe he <laughs> attends like Princeton uh, or Yale, something like that. He's very much an East Coast intellectual nerd um, with this uh, streak of, you know, he fine with killing and murdering. He reminded me in some ways of the Matt Damon character in uh, The Good Shepherd, that sort yeah. of uh, a person. Uh, you know, he's he's a sort of straight laced guy. But when push comes to shove, yeah, he'll he'll throw a woman out of a plane or something like that, like Matt Damon did in uh, the in the Good Shepherd. Now, in the in the movie instead, Pyle is from Texas. Uh, he's never he's actually never named. He's in the movie. He's just called the American. We never get uh, they never call him Pyle, which is also sort of interesting. And he goes from this uh, sort of intellectual egghead to a, oh, gee, golly, America's so great, apple pie. You know, I'm going to bring Fong back to Texas. He, he sort of comes off like a Boy Scout, a really, really annoying Boy Scout. <laughs> um, so those are really, I think those are, those are serious fundamental changes to the tone of the film. Uh, and again, he's... Uh, um, Mankiewicz is very, very uh, clever with the casting of Pyle. Uh, Pyle is uh, played by uh, Audie Murphy, who was uh, uh, he was an actor, but was, is one of the most decorated uh, soldiers through World War II. He has every from a Purple Heart to a, a Congressional Medal of Freedom. Uh, he's got a Silver Star. I mean, he's he's really. I mean, I guess you know got all of them through fighting in world war ii but was a heavily decorated he was all over the place people knew him for his war record and the sort of uh you know his bravery and whatnot uh so that's also very deliberate the you know people would people saw audie murphy and were like oh yes of course this is the great war hero of world war ii who also does films uh so he, like for instance like if you go to his wikipedia page it's not a picture of him in a movie it's a picture of him in his you know his military suit with a, you know his whole chest is covered in medals so uh, sure. that's very deliberate as well well and even the, like the little summary paragraph it's mostly about him and his war record and the, yes. oh yeah and then he later became an actor right um, exactly yeah so yeah. that's what he symbolized to people yes. that's who they chose and even in simple things like um, throughout the film, or through most of the film, the American character is pretty much always dressed in white from head to toe, yes. whereas Fowler's character is dressed in this sort of amoral, ambiguous, dark grey. <laughs> so he he's not only, I don't know, depoliticized it, like I say, but also shifted the morality around completely. Because in the original book, it's not like Fowler's a hero and Pyle is the enemy. It's more a classic, dramatic, protagonist-antagonist relationship that they have. Whereas, yeah, people perceived the book to be anti-American, and I guess it's anti-American interventionism, certainly. I wouldn't say it's, like, anti-American in the broad sense. Whereas in the film, it's very pro-American, and yeah. Fowler is... He's also relegated to the sidelines somewhat. The story is, mm -hmm. if anything, made more about Pyle than it is about Fowler. Yeah. Even though he's the one telling the story. So, mm. yeah, they've, they've not only changed what the film is about but also changed where your sympathies are supposed to lie mm. and like you say the casting of Audie Murphy is a pretty obvious move in that direction but um oh and one one just quick thing uh that is perhaps one of the biggest is that uh Pyle in the 58 film doesn't work for the government he works for the Friends for Free course. Asia which is some foundation which, you know, again, very, very similar to the American Friends of Vietnam or any of these uh, CIA front groups out there. But I think that's another important thing. In the book, Pyle is working directly for the U.S. government, uh, of course, as an economic attache or I forget that he has a word for what he he does, which is, of course, incredibly vague. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in the it's basically I work at the embassy and mm. people go, oh, right, I see. Right, yes. right. Yeah. Whereas in the movie, he works for this foundation. Uh, there is a, an interesting uh, a nod to uh, in the movie to him sort of have there being something more to that where he says uh, that he has a, a rich and powerful friend in exile who is funding his foundation or is funding his work there, which is, I think, a nod to DM 
but uh, you know that that's it, it's vague enough that you don't know. But that's a really important thing is that he's just this. Oh, I, I just want to help the poor Vietnamese. I'm just here doing you know God's work with this NGO or whatever. Whereas, of course, in the in the novel, it's much more complicated than that. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, well, I guess we should get right into the the difficult question because scholars and commentators do very much disagree on this point. To what extent did Lansdale influence this production? Mm. Because there is this letter from Lansdale to Mankiewicz in 1956, right? While he was rewriting this story and producing the screenplay that we then watched. And most of, at least according to to Simon Wilmetz's research, most of the changes that were already already made by that point, or at least Mankiewicz was already... thinking of making those changes by that point and he wrote to Lansdale to ask his advice and his opinions on yeah basically what do you think of this <laughs> and this is why Lansdale writes back that letter and of course we'll link up a copy of this for people so I guess the idea that some people have advanced that this whole thing was rewritten to suit some CIA agenda I don't really buy that I think that's a simplification but what it does show is that Lansdale very much encouraged this He encouraged Mankiewicz to take this direction. I think we can certainly say that much. And I'm also wondering the question of why did he write to Lansdale in the first place? Mm. Lansdale, of all people. Why? Well, uh, I mean, what do you make of all of this? Because I know you may want to go in a slightly different direction. Well, uh, I will say why he wrote to Lansdale is because he met him a year prior to him writing that letter in Saigon when Mankiewicz was scouting locations. Um, So... I don't know how they met. I don't know if it was quote unquote by chance. <laughs> you know, is uh, you know, Mank was just walking around, Lansdale bumps into him. But they did meet. Uh and I think he even refer- he makes reference to that in the nineteen fifty six letter, uh, about that, that they had met. So I mean my question is did Lansdale already kind of plant the seeds in, in Mankowitz's mind uh early on? There's also a, quite a bit that uh, Mankiewicz felt betrayed later in life by Lansdale because Lansdale portrayed DM as this sort of wonderful, you know, Thomas Jefferson of of Vietnam, and right, he, he right. felt duped. Which is okay, maybe, but come on, you know, do you really think the CIA is, <laughs> you know, finding the Thomas Jefferson? But uh, I, so I, you know, yeah, I wonder uh, how much uh, of Mankiewicz's changes were prompted by their initial meeting and also how much of this was sort of a way to uh please Lansdale or to get access to actually filming in Saigon which th- this movie did which was as far as we know it's pretty unprecedented uh in 1950s to take an entire movie uh stu- you know they people didn't go to shoot on location very often if they did perhaps it was in Europe um, but no, oh, yeah, yeah. There were films being, you know, made in in Germany, for example, because after the war, you had the American, you had the complete denazification of the German film industry, yes. and the whole thing was basically replaced by Americans. So there was a fair bit of filming in Berlin and what have you. But no, the idea of going to film in Vietnam as well, while it's in the middle of this civil war, yeah. Um, <laughs> Which <laughs> no, Lansdale you didn't was, do that. Yeah, and um, Lansdale was instrumental in get, in, a, in making DM allow them to film there. And of course, in the beginning of the film, there before it starts, there's a little thank you to the to DM and the you know government of Vietnam for allowing us to film there. And to be to be fair, the cinematography is great. It, it is just a gorgeous looking movie. Um, mm. In part because they they actually filmed you know they film in Saigon. Uh, they film at the the Khao Dai Temple, the Holy See of the Khao Dai, which is an insane looking <laughs> mm. um, uh, church or whatever you would call it. Yeah, I mean, I think also that letter is really interesting in that it, it, obviously we don't have Minkowitz's letter. Uh, I'd love to to find a copy of that, but it, it very much seems like. Mankiewicz, I just can't imagine that Mankiewicz was making all of these changes without being somewhat informed by Lansdale. So this is all just me sort of off the top of my head, but I wonder if Lansdale sort of planted some seeds and then waited and then Mankiewicz writes him his le- this letter and then Lansdale kind of fills him in because they talk about the fact that, yes, General Tay was 
that he he committed these these bombings of the Continental in 1952. He went on the radio and said that I did it. Uh, you know, but Lansdale says, well, something like, uh, where is it? Um, quote, since General Tay is quite a national hero for his fight against Bin Yuan in 1955, and in keeping with your treatment of this actually having been a communist action, I'd suggest that you just go right ahead and let it be finally revealed that the communists did it after all, even to faking the radio broadcast, which would have been easy to do. So again, uh, <laughs> how the how the hell does Mankiewicz know that? You know, um, I, I just can't imagine that he was fully aware of that. And also in that letter, uh, uh, Lansdale says that yeah, General Tay got these bombs, and he says they were that they were probably from uh, the French Expeditionary Corps. So in 1952, he gets these bombs from the French, and then Lansdale goes on to say. Quote, since the French handled the supplies of all munitions to our side, U.S. military supplies were handled by the French entirely in Vietnam. So again, uh, just more sort of evidence that the CIA was involved with General Tay, at least back in 1952. Uh, so those sort of things, I just can't really buy that, that Mankiewicz was like, Oh, you know what? I'm going to make General Tay the good guy. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to change the story and make this about the communists and all this other stuff. And I'll just check in with Lansdale to make sure that's accurate. So, I mean, again, you think there's just, more to it than that, basically. Is yeah, what you're, what you're driving. I think definitely. Well, and we could I, reconstruct know, this in a, a slightly different way that just occurs to me while you were saying that is that Mankiewicz goes out there in 55 to scout locations. Presumably, he could only do that with government approval. I don't think they would have just let him go and wander around in right. this relatively... I mean, maybe they would. This is in the 50s. But you know what I mean? If he's then meeting with government officials mm. and they're telling him stuff and they're feeding him whatever in order to help him write his screenplay, and one of those people was Lansdale, then a couple of years... Well, a year later, he then writes to Lansdale. He says they have this conversation about where this, the direction of this screenplay is going. And we know from that book... Uh, remind me the name of it. Edward Lansdale's Cold War, which is by Jonathan Michelle. Sure. We know from that that Lansdale actually reviewed the script as well. Mm. And then he helps him. And apparently Dulles, Alan Dulles, helped get permission to, for them to go and film there. That suggests a, just a larger process, doesn't it? Mm. It suggests more influence than just this, you know, one bit of correspondence, no? Oh, of, of course. Also, in that letter, it's Lansdale that suggests that Pyle work for an American foundation. So, again, is that is Mankiewicz really changing these? Th I mean, he, he, perhaps he was changing them. But again, was that prompted by, well, if I change these, then maybe I can get a little bit more access? Uh, you know, was this perhaps Mankiewicz's sort of audition tape? Uh, or at least that this would, uh, this would, if he made these changes, he could get cooperation from Lansdale and Dulles and they could film in Vietnam. I don't know. But the fact On that is specific point, as I remember, Wilmetz makes the argument that uh, that was all to do with the production code and that he couldn't explicitly portray him as being a member of a government agency. Mm -hmm. But given that it's kind of half disguised in the book anyway, right? I'm not entirely sure that was certainly not the only reason. For mm. that change and like you say lansdale certainly encourages this and says yeah yeah make him yeah. make him work for this whatever freedom friends foundation <laughs> um <laughs> call he, it what so, you like yeah he also says that if pile were to stumble into a Viet Minh plot that he would be killed which is essentially what happens in the movie mm. so again i mean it, it I understand there's a lot of, uh, I think scholars are, uh, with this in particular, there's a lot of arguing because, uh, you know, these are sort of polarizing figures. Um, yes. And I think there is a bit of a pushback to sort of, oh, it's not really that big a deal, or it doesn't quite, you know, the, the, the CIA Hollywood connection doesn't go that far. But this is pretty, I don't know, I, for me, I'm, I'm fairly convinced and I know that we had we had, we had talked about this once before, Tom, but I sort of viewed this, too, as the CIA, generally speaking, looks at the big picture. I don't think the CIA initially got involved in Vietnam in the very early 50s with the sort of uh, notion that oh, we're, we'll, we'll just leave in a little while. I think they saw Vietnam, A, as a this is this is great for us. Look at how much opium there is. 
this is this is what the CIA is all about is controlling drug trades to a large degree because it it fills a huge black budget. Uh, I think they saw that. I think they saw this is this is near to China. This is uh, a great little staging ground for anything we want to do. This is a great training ground. Think about how Daniel Ellsberg cut his teeth in Vietnam. <laughs> uh, you know, learning how to assassinate people and hanging out with uh, uh, cork, uh, what, uh, um, opium smugglers from the cork, uh, um What's that island? Corsicans. Corsican, yeah, yeah Corsican <laughs> opium smugglers. Um, and I think that in many ways the CIA understood that the French will eventually leave Vietnam. That's just a, a given. And I think so you think they saw this as an opportunity. You think they saw. This is, you know, the writings on the wall for French colonial rule there. Someone's going to fill that power vacuum. Let's get in there and get our hooks into something. Oh, of course, because, I mean, all the old colonial powers were, were on the app. I mean, the French, the English, uh, you know, all of these, these, these former. And of course, who filled that void was the, the Americans. So I think, yeah, full well, they knew that the French are not going to last in Vietnam, but we could, you know, or we could at least get our, our claws in there. We can start really you know, fucking shit up <laughs> to be very blunt. <laughs> and I think that in many ways, again, Lansdale, what did he do before he got involved in the military and in the CIA? He was an advertising executive. Yep. I think he understood trends. I think he understood the power of something like cinema. So is it, you know, coincidental that he gets involved with Mankiewicz, that he, you know, urges this movie to be, uh, you know, push forward with these sort of changes. I don't think so. I think that, and by all accounts, when this movie came out, you know, Lansdale, uh, he wrote to DM telling him that this was going to have a tremendous impact. This is really basically good PR for us. Lansdale invited uh, members from uh, pretty much every government agency or department that d- dealt with psychological, political, or security affairs to a pre-screening in Washington, D.C., and then later told the chairman of the uh, American Friends of Vietnam, of which Mankiewicz was later a member, uh, that they all seemed to enjoy it as much as I did. <laughs> uh, <and> the, <laughs> the AFV also sponsored the, the, quote, world premiere at Washington's Playhouse Theater. So you've got a lot of people seemingly heavily invested in this Hollywood film, uh, with many of them with connections back to the military and intelligence apparatus. So yeah, I, I this is and this is just my theory, but I, I very much see that L- Lansdale was a smart guy. I mean, I don't, you don't have to like him, uh, but he was a smart. Well, he was guy. a horrible guy, but he was right. very smart. Yeah. Um, and I think again, his his experience as an advertising executive, he saw the power of marketing. Uh, you know, hence why they 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 do this movie in Saigon. Hey, maybe a little bit of a tourist boom, or at least to to portray it as oh, it was safe enough for this this movie crew to go down there. Uh, you know, everything is fine in Vietnam. I mean, that's why he's writing to DM that this is going to be great for us. This makes the communists look bad. It makes you ultimately look good. Uh, and so, yeah, and I think this just sort of, in my opinion, illustrates the, uh, the, the, the broad way that the CIA looked at, at Hollywood films. Again, this is what, two years after they do 1984? And only four yeah. years after they did Animal Farm. So this isn't like there was a trend going on there in terms of making these sort of movies and, and involving themselves in Hollywood. So that's my two cents on that whole topic. Well, sure. And the one final question, I guess, in this, in figuring out this puzzle, and people can disagree with us, people can make up their own minds, of course. But the other question is, who was Lansdale? Because when you think about it, this guy was a covert warfare specialist. Mm -hmm. He spent most of his career working between the CIA and Air Force intelligence. He, like you mentioned, he developed this pseudo gang strategy to counter the Huck Rebellion in the Philippines in the early 50s. He then turns up in Vietnam doing similar kinds of things. He was also the head of operations for the Cuba Project. Operation Mongoose, the uh, plan to assassinate or overthrow Fidel Castro. And... This is something that I don't think that many people realize. It was actually Lansdale who developed Operation Northwoods. Mm. He was, Mm. um, for those of you who don't know, Northwoods was a plan to carry out a series of covert operations, including false flag terrorist attacks in the U.S., which would then be blamed on Castro and the communists and be used as an excuse to invade Cuba. Mm. Involved airplanes, right? (laughs) involving all sorts. Um, But Lansdale was absolutely at the centre of that. I've got a 
we've got the papal trail basically to prove this that he was instrumental in developing these ideas and you can read kind of early versions of these ideas actually appear in memos with his name on so he was right in the middle of all of this and so the notion that lansdale was doing the same sort of thing in 50s vietnam and that graham green somehow got wind of this and decided to put it into his book is not that far-fetched not at all and if, and if that's not that far-fetched the notion that lansdale would spot this and decide to in some way you know infiltrate the filmmaking process and have a bit of influence on that is almost to be expected given mm-hmm. who he was isn't it i think that's just that that's a classic uh cia tactic that's what they 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 always do that um i mean that's that again i uh, i think why this is such a great um movie and a book and, and and something to pick up on for this the second season is that this is what the cia is doing in all of these sort of films you know that's what the cia did in charlie wilson's war let's insert mm-hmm. ourselves into this hollywood film and completely alter the the reality of what was going on so yeah of course i think that lansdale was smart enough to know okay green is writing this or he wrote this book right uh, and people are interested in making it into a movie. Let me make sure that I can can manipulate that movie because you know this is. I, I can't just let this go on. You know, I can't let this happen. I mean, well, his but, reputation was at stake. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that uh, again, and this is something uh, that we the, the CIA seems to have a, a some sort of vendetta about uh, British writers. Of course, because they you know, completely, you know, co-opted and de- uh, destroyed uh, everything that George Orwell was trying to say in Animal Form and in 1984 in their uh, CIA productions of those films. So I don't think it's much of a surprise that they they didn't like Graham Greene either. There's a little bit of cultural post-colonialism. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Um, <laughs> and, and Lansdale also, furthermore, this is just a, a sort of an aside, but I thought it's interesting. Uh, he, he definitely, along with hating the, you know, the... The, the British colonialists, he also hated the, the French colonialists even more. And he constantly wrote about this in his journals. Uh, when he was first posted there in 1953, he was like an, uh, an observer. Of course, you know, yeah, what was he observing? But in a, there's a journal entry he wrote that's, again, this in this book, Edward Lansdale's Cold War in 1954. He, uh, you know, he just he couldn't stand the French. He always wanted to make them look bad. Um, no matter what. And there was a brothel that was frequented by French soldiers that was near to where he worked. And uh, at the time, General O'Daniel was in uh, Saigon. He was sort of the head military observer. He was sent there uh, by Eisenhower. And there was a, you know, they were constantly filming O'Daniel, and then they would send this around to, oh, this is what's going on, you know, look at this, at, at, you know, military briefings and things like that. So Lansdale picks up a movie camera, he goes to uh, this brothel. He pretends to be a Hollywood talent scout, and he starts <laughs> yelling at these soldiers. Who, uh, according to Lansdale, uh, in vi- you know they they just des- they describe in vivid pantomime their intentions toward each other. And then he you know and and then he brought the camera back and thought, well, this will be hilarious when they actually show this <laughs> to you know to the military observers and the advisors. There, they're going to see. You know how horrible the French are. So this guy was constantly, <laughs> uh, you know, do little things like that. So yeah, I don't think it's a big jump to think that he would get involved in a Hollywood film where he could completely alter uh, the. And again, this is at a time when people don't understand what's going on in Vietnam. They have no, they have no concept of how deeply involved the CIA is. So why not again get ahead of this? Let's stave this off for a couple more years. Let's. You know, we, we, we've got at least until the 60s before we really have to start worrying about it. So, uh, you know, let's let's make this movie. This will placate the masses. Possibly so. Yeah. I did think of one other possibility um, or at least one other factor in this. And that's that when Graham Greene denied that Pyle is Lansdale or that he was based on Lansdale, he kind of had to because otherwise someone could sue him. Lansdale yeah. could sue him. But as a result, Lansdale couldn't sue him. So his little bit of revenge, perhaps, was to you know, take a gigantic steaming dump all over <laughs> Graham Greene's book. Mm. Maybe there is a little bit of, you know, personal revenge and vendetta involved in, oh, in yeah. why Lansdale got involved in this film. Mm. But mm. Um, I guess the final element to all of this that we just want to highlight for people, really, is the fact that both Graham Greene, 
who wrote the original book, and Michael Redgrave, who plays Fowler in the film, uh, both of them have intelligence files due to their suspected communism or mm-hmm. communist connections. In Green's case, we're talking very trivial stuff. He joined the Communist Party for a matter of a few weeks, mm. and his FBI file says he paid them like 28 cents or something. <laughs> yeah. um, and this was back when he was at university, and the FBI file says that this led to various delays and problems with him getting visas to enter or pass through the United States. And there's one document in this file that has been completely redacted by the CIA that relates to Green's trip to Cuba, which is presumably because the CIA had a spy in Cuba who was following Green around while he was there. Um, Meanwhile, Redgrave's file, which is MI5, also covers this exact same period when he starred in two different CIA-assisted movies and was awarded an MBE and a knighthood. (laughs) So (laughs) we've been trying to make sense of all of this. Um, And we're still not entirely sure what all of this adds up to, what all of this means. But I think there was some kind of secret Cold War going on in Hollywood. And this is one, this whole story of this film, but also the thing with Green and certainly with Redgrave, is a chapter in that story, which is, I think, as yet untold. The whole notion of, well, how did the Cold War play out in Hollywood? Mm, (laughs) The whole notion of who were the KGB spies in Hollywood, for example. There must have been some, but yet, does anyone know their names? I don't. Mm. And I've tried tried to find this stuff, but I don't know. So Mm. certainly an element for people to think about, I think. Certainly. And again, the the, number of... Uh, you know, communist leaning writers or actors in Hollywood that pop up in these CIA movies is is quite astounding. I mean, Michael Redgrave again. Why are they? You know, this is a you know he could have been blacklisted. He, Dalton Trumbo, same thing. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it, there's there's something very curious going on with the the you know dating back to like like the Hollywood Ten as you've talked about Tom, um, mm-hmm. and there there seems to again. Uh, there seems to be a sort of a fascination with uh, using these people, uh, um, you know, on behalf of the CIA, or that the CIA is is more or less comfortable doing it. So there's still definitely something to be explored there. As you said, we haven't really quite been able to make heads or tails of it, but it is interesting that we see people like Redgrave popping up in two CIA assisted films with so you know a fairly large. A uh, file on him about how he's a communist. Well, and th- there's a fairly large file on him about how he's, a, how he's a communist, but then two years later he gets given a knighthood. Yes. <laughs> right. So what, what's all this about? When, there's got to be something going on here in terms of like the establishment's co-opting of certain communists or pseudo-communists within the media. Yeah. Um, and on the subject of communism and the media industry, <laughs> in the next episode we're going to be picking this up and trying to make some more sense of it and maybe managing to make a bit more sense of it in the form of looking at good night and good luck which is all about the the murrow mccarthy ding dong in 1954 the exact same time that green and lansdale were in vietnam (laughs) so this all connect doesn't Mm. it um and so before we wrap up is there anything else you just want to add on the quiet american um yeah just just that uh, i think uh i i I really do love Graham Greene. I think his novels are great, and I think that uh, a lot of people in the alt media should should uh, give him a give him a look because I think there's so much in there. Um, and, and the Quiet American isn't even my favorite. Uh, you know, he, he's he's written so many things. He's just an interesting person in himself. Definitely check out things like The Third Man as one of my favorite movies. And, and Graham Greene was deeply involved in writing that, and he was friends with Carol Reed. Uh, and it's also it's got Orson Welles, Joseph Cotton. Uh, filmed in in uh, you know post war Austria, so what's not to like about that? But yeah, and just that uh, Green was uh, really was a, a prophetic writer in a lot of ways, and uh, I don't think he gets quite enough credit. I think he gets kind of overshadowed by people like John Le Carre, uh, you know, who he's he's the spy novel writer. Yeah. And, and Graham Green wasn't a, a spy novelist. You know, he wrote uh, he wrote all sorts of different. He wrote autobiographical stuff he he wrote um you know i mean a lot of his uh, books deal with a sort of ca- you know catholic morality tale and mm-hmm. uh, you know maybe that's why i'm interested in it being uh you know being raised as a catholic and you can't really uh you can't really shake that off <laughs> if you're <laughs> if you're a catholic but um 
Yeah, I think it, uh, yeah, just, just to really, uh, I think it's worth it to read the book and then watch the movie and then listen to this podcast. I'm sure most people won't be doing that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and, and as it, there's just, there's so many little things, uh, in the book that are just fascinating to see. Again, this whole, the cow die is the, the most bizarre religious sect you've never heard of. Uh, when you start looking into it and, you're, and you then you start seeing why the hell was the CIA involved with these? They're like a fusion of Buddhist, Confucian, and Christian beliefs. Um, they have a pope. They believe that Victor Hugo is a saint, as well as Dr. Sun Yat-sen, Joan of Arc, Thomas Jefferson, and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, and they also had this, this very powerful uh, militia that was run by General Tay. So really interesting stuff. And yeah, I just... Uh, Again, I just can't recommend Graham Greene enough. Yeah, and just in case we haven't given people quite enough to do is their (laughs) homework for this episode. We will also, of course, point out that the 2002 adaptation of the book is much more honest. Yes, it's Uh, great. It's a much more authentic telling. I think it's a, a better film in a lot of ways. Not that the original film is kind of bad, but just that this one's better. Um, and it also filmed in Vietnam. And so it has that very much visual authenticity about it and. The two leading actors, Brendan Fraser and Michael Caine, both excellent, both very, very believable, though very engaging, mm-hmm. you know, very mm-hmm. good performances. So if people are looking for something else to do, they can mm-hmm. watch that, I yep. guess. And just to point out, of course, it was directed by Philip Noyce, who also directed Salt, which mm-hmm. we'll be looking at in seven or eight episodes time. So... <laughs> Yeah, and just as a reminder, next episode we will be looking at Good Night and Good Luck, which is the first of three films involving George Clooney and Grant Heslov. And we're going to be talking with Ed Opperman of The Opperman Report all about that one. So that's something to stay tuned for, something to look forward to. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The CIA and Hollywood. If you want to hear some more of me and Tom's work, and catch up on every episode of the CIA and Hollywood, then you can always visit my website, PorkinsPolicyReview.com, and you can always visit Tom's website, SpyCulture.com. Well, thank you all so much for joining us, and Tom and I will be talking to you very soon. Mm -hmm.